Every year our annual meetings are inspirational, but I think that next year in Washington, we will be inspired by these incredible keynote speakers, by the opportunity to think through our advocacy, celebrate our successes for 50 years, and think about together how leading age is going to mark the next 50 years. But as we're thinking about Washington, many of us are tired and bleary-eyed this morning because last night we stayed up to watch the results of the election. So many of us have lots of questions about what's going on in Washington. Well, we have lots of questions about what's going on in Washington most days. I think today we just have more. To help us answer these questions, please join me in welcoming back ASA's President and CEO, Larry Minix. You answer all those questions. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. What we thought we would do this morning through a panel of senior advocacy staff is uh, talk to you about what happens literally in the next few days, um, the next few weeks, and the next few months around our advocacy program. Um, this country um, elects its leaders uh, every two years and every four years, and um, before and after uh, those elections, our work uh, goes on. Uh, we thought we would highlight some people today uh, because, as you know, we're losing uh, Susan, and uh, oftentimes um, either Susan or I are the most visible uh, personas of your advocacy program, uh, but it uh, is a team of very um, well-respected and knowledgeable people that uh, do advocacy on your behalf. Uh, there are two major channels that we uh, develop our advocacy program through. One is obviously through you. There are numerous um, commissions, cabinets, uh, task forces that are uh, convened uh, to address uh, problems. This past year, uh, and you'll hear a bit more about it, uh, when the uh, Government Accountability Office um, made inquiry about CCRCs. Uh, well, we instantly put together uh, a, a task force uh, to help uh, address those concerns and to uh, provide places and people that the Government Accountability Office could visit to understand what a CCRC uh, is. Uh, we have a Housing with Services uh, Committee that is helping to not only uh, bridge um, issues between HUD and HHS to make the Housing with Services model uh, much easier for residents to use and youth to manage, uh, but that's some of the um, uh, most experienced and smartest people um, in uh, housing. Uh, as you heard from Wynn, we need to get all of you involved in advocacy. He's asking for 15 minutes of advocacy from every one of you and your employees um, uh, on a, um, a regular uh, basis. So we will be developing that whole grassroots program in the coming years, and you'll hear more about that in just a moment. Uh, I thought you also would want to know that we do a lot of work through the creation of leadership-type organizations, um, and we'll put some names up on the screen uh, here for you. Uh, we're involved, uh, for example, uh, in uh, the, the creation of a new not-for-profit corporation called Advanced Class. Um, and it is made up of board members from um, the leaders in the disability and aging communities and will have uh, eventually business leaders and others. Uh, the mission of it is to see that class is successfully implemented and more broadly um, help educate the public about the need for financial uh, planning. Uh, we uh, helped create a group called the Leadership Council of Aging Organizations uh, some almost 20 years ago. Um, and um, advancing excellence um, in nursing home care, uh, tried, um, chaired by Dr. Mary Jane uh, Corrin. Um, uh, Bonnie Gauthier, uh, one of your uh, members and our board uh, secretary, uh, along with Susan Weiss, has been our representative um, uh, on that. The Elderly Housing Coalition, the Low Income Housing Coalition, uh, an interesting organization that I chair now called Generations United, and it is committed to uh, making sure that policy that affects seniors and children 
is done in a concerted way so that we don't become divided. A very important kind of mission, you don't hear much about it, but uh, um, is uh, something that we uh, spend a lot of time with. Newly created recently is the Long-Term Quality Alliance, uh, chaired by Dr. Mary Naylor from Penn. Uh, includes people like Dr. Uh, Mark McClellan um, and uh, others uh, from the uh, provider, professional, government world. And it's committed to uh, finding ways to improve specific areas of quality. The next few years on um, how do you prevent um, unnecessary hospitalizations. That's where the most quality of life is often lost with vulnerable seniors and where the most money in Medicare is wasted. And um, it's uh, newly created, it's off and running. You'll be hearing more, even um, many of you invited to participate um, in uh, projects. A group called the Elder Care Workforce um, uh, Alliance, and um, uh, one that I'm sure many of you know is the Center for Excellence in Assisted Living. Our own Steve Mogg um, chairs uh, that uh, effort. Uh, and it was su successful several years ago in uh, defining uh, some standards and parameters around assisted living and doing our best to keep the federal government from getting into the regulation of it so that we don't reinvent um, regulation in, uh, that we've uh, seen in the nursing home uh, field. These are important uh, activities and we're at every table. We've been involved in helping to create every one of them. And you need to know that leading age advocacy, uh, a major responsibility is being leaders around the development and um, uh, the ongoing work of important uh, coalitions. You also might want to know that we retain um, lobbying counsel, a um, firm called Clark & Weinstock. Uh, we've used them for almost uh, 10 years. They have very strong um, Republican and Democrat ties. The principal in the firm is uh, Vin Weber, the Honorable Vin Weber, uh, who was a multi-term Republican congressman from uh, Minnesota, and he's part of the uh, Republican uh, think tank uh, leadership group. We have strategy sessions every week with Clark and Weinstock and our staff and our friends around how to advance uh, what we're doing on a regular weekly basis around important uh, issues uh, for you. Uh, the work that you do through these task forces and committees and the work we do through the strategy uh, session with um, our friends and other groups uh, ultimately comes to our board. Uh, many of those issues are vetted um, in uh, state associations, um, the House of Delegates, uh, but um, uh, we make sure that um, uh, to the extent we possibly can, uh, we get input from you uh, on these issues and many of you write um, and uh, express your opinion uh, directly to uh, some of us. Uh, these activities, um, some of them are paid for through your dues, um, and you dues uh, pay for about a third of our uh, $19 million uh, budget. Others uh, require grant funding. Um, for example, the Commonwealth Fund has been ge very generous over the last uh, few years in funding development of the state lanes in advancing excellence. And um, uh, they uh, have uh, seen that as an important uh, project. Uh, CMS puts uh, a lot of money in that as well, so uh, the, the various parties um, uh, can participate, many of whom don't, do not have uh, big uh, budgets uh, for that uh, kind of activity. Um, a relatively new foundation that is funding the first year of advanced class is the SCAN Foundation, based right here in Southern California. They have been a breath of fresh air on advocacy. They come and help create policy forums in which many of the issues that can become so difficult to talk through, as uh, uh, Dr. Sandell told us in our opening session, the SCAN Foundation helps create forums of people where we can get to uh, what uh, good policy uh, ought to be. And they're very generous uh, support of uh, projects around technology and housing with services models, as well as um, um, assuring the first year's funding of advanced class. Uh, so um, we are very appreciative of their uh, support. Um, we get other kinds of special project support from uh, groups like um, um, Enterprise, um, uh, who has helped us with uh, housing with services uh, summit, uh, the McGregor um, 
a foundation that uh, has helped us with projects around housing with services. Evercare um, has um, uh, helped us with a couple of, so we seek uh, outside funding for projects that are normally not in the uh, uh, stream of things. So we wanted to uh, review with you that um, uh, there, there's an awful lot that goes into um, uh, coming to our positions and making sure we're at the main tables of the policy uh, discussion and uh, be happy to respond to questions about that uh, any time. And between now and the first of the year, uh, we'll be um, uh, uh, appointing um, uh, various uh, committees and task forces. And many of you will stop me and say, gee, I'd like to be involved in something. If you'll send me um, uh, an email and tell me what your interests are, we'll be uh, glad to try to get you um, uh, involved. So with that, I'm gonna ask some of my uh, colleagues uh, to come out. Um, and uh, let me um, uh, introduce them um, uh, to you as um, they come on out. I, I think I still have colleagues that are working with us. There they are. Um, while they're being seated, uh, Lauren, Sh Lauren Sham is our VP for uh, communications. Uh, she has done an outstanding job um, and since she's been with us in getting us uh, high level media visibility and now is responsible for grass uh, roots. And she's going to talk a bit about that in a few minutes. Marsha Greenfield is um, effective uh, December the 10th at five o'clock when Susan says she's uh, walking out and turning out the lights. Marsha will be your acting senior VP for advocacy. I know of no one, thank you, that's well deserved. I know of no one on uh, uh, Capitol Hill that uh, has um, uh, more uh, respectability around our issues than Marcia. Of course, Susan and um, Susan is uh, going to um, uh, make some presentation around a couple of special issues. Then I'm going to ask her uh, to impart a little uh, post-election wisdom uh, for us uh, as we finish our session today. Dr. Barbara Mannard, I think many of you know uh, Barbara. She is the, um, the, the thought leadership uh, genius around helping us pull together the right thing for the right reasons for funding and, and supporting long-term services and supports, which ultimately resulted in the class um, uh, provisions of health reform. And again, I know of uh, no one in Washington that's more respected about, around her expertise, not only about that, but Medicare and Medicaid uh, reimbursement. Barbara Gay, Barbara writes all of the, um, uh, the, the basic stuff you get every Friday, bringing you up to date on the issues. And uh, Barbara has uh, been with us uh, a long time and understands the breadth of the issues uh, as well as anyone on our staff of, and the interrelationship of uh, those. And by the way, is a very popular uh, speaker at our state association meetings and uh, represents you in uh, three or four of these major um, uh, coalitions. So with those introductions, I'm gonna pitch it to them and they'll gonna brief you on some stuff of what happens beginning today after um, a, a very important uh, election yesterday. Thank before they can leave town. Um, Congress is going to make a cameo appearance back in Washington on November 15th. Then they'll recess again, come back after Thanksgiving, and stay probably through jingle bells. Um, some of them are going to be licking their wounds. Some of them will be popping champagne corks. During the lame duck session, we'll already see some new senators getting seated, uh, the senators from West Virginia, Delaware, Illinois. They're going to start orientation for the new legislators that got elected uh, who will take their seats in January. And there's going to be some sorting out of leadership in the two parties for the coming Congress. Some committee chairs did lose their bids for re-election last night. And so um, we will be seeing new, a whole new group of committee chairs on the committees that matter to us. In addition, the very influential committees like those that oversee Medicare and Medicaid um, will see current, more junior Democratic members losing their seats and um, Republican members being appointed um, to kind of reorganize the committees. So we'll have a whole new group of legislators to be targeted in the next Congress for you to advocate and do grassroots advocacy. We've asked uh, 
some experts as to how much of an agenda Congress will have in the lame duck session, and we've gotten some different stories. Um, Larry may have mentioned Vin Weber and um, Clark and Weinstock. We often consult with them, and we ask them, will the Democrats try to jam as much of their agenda into the lame duck session as possible so that as they can get as much done as they can before they lose control of the House next year? Or will they simply throw in the towel and just leave everything for the Republicans? And Vin Weber and his group said, yes. So it remains to be seen. <laughs> it does remain to be seen um, their level of ambition following a very strenuous election. But there are a few things that Congress absolutely has to get done. First of all, the current spending bill only lasts through December, so we need another omnibus spending bill to take the federal government through uh, some portion, at least, of the current fiscal year. We also anticipate that Congress is going to do some work on expiring tax breaks, expiring tax cuts. We're hopeful that some of that legislation will provide a vehicle for some of the things that we want to get done, because we have our own agenda for the lame duck session. We have Medicare items that are must do. We have to get something done on rugs for effective date. We have to get another extension of the therapy caps exceptions process. And we want Congress to do something on the observation days problem that's become more and more widespread throughout the country. We also have our signature Section 202 Senior Housing Reform Bill. It is so close to passage. Um, many of you have been working with us extremely hard on that legislation. We, want, we don't want to see it die for lack of final action by Congress. And finally, we need to make sure there's funding available for senior housing, for home and community-based services, so that you all have the resources you need to provide the services that your residents and clients need. Just looking, peeking ahead a little bit to the 112th Congress, there's been a lot of speculation as to what impact yesterday's election results are going to have on health care reform. We certainly know that the Republican leadership in the House plans to have a vote on repealing health care reform right out of the starting gate in January. We think that that's probably as far as repeal of health care reform is going to go. The Democrats still control the Senate. President Obama is still at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue with his veto pen. So we don't really see repeal legislation succeeding for the next two years. An alternative strategy for people who uh, oppose health care reform might be to sort of defund it, to pass legislation saying CMS cannot use funds to implement health care reform. For the same reasons that we don't see outright repeal succeeding, we don't think that the defunding effort will succeed either. But there will definitely be significant fights both in the House and the Senate on modifications to health care reform. These could range anywhere from a technical correction, dotting the I's and crossing the T's, to removal of significant portions like maybe the individual responsibility section. Uh, the more significant the change in health care reform, probably the less likely the legislation would be to succeed. But that's where we see a lot of the activity around health care reform in the next Congress. Thanks. Wow, Barbara. <laughs> okay, that gets us kind of through January. Yeah, about. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> even in the midst of confusion, it's pretty clear through January. So, uh, what about the rest of our future in aging services in this field? As all of us go back to work, most of us to a somewhat colder grimmer place than uh, Los Angeles. I'm going back pumped up from all the opportunities I've had to learn from you about the innovative, wonderful, effective things you're doing to continue the same loving care that you've been providing for all these years in tougher times, doing more for less. And the hospitality that Los Angeles has provided us is really emblematic of the arms that you have stretched across the country to gather in, embrace, 
and celebrate lives long lived, including that of my 91-year-old fabulous mom, cared for by Asas Christwood down in Louisiana, where I'm from. Thanks, Christwood. <laughs> so where do we go from here in our field? As a nation, we know we have a huge challenge before us. We can't keep doing things the way we have been doing, and the healthcare system that we are all so much a part of as participants, as consumers, as providers, as policy analysts, this has got to change. We're spending 17% of our gross domestic product on the healthcare system. It's growing, and that's got to bend downward. We can't keep doing what we've been doing. It's unsustainable. We have a mismatch of resources. We have excess capacity of hospitals and other facilities in the middle of our country and on the edges and, and, and coast of our country. We have growing numbers of underserved people and there's not enough money in the world to take all that bricks and mortar and move it around the country and replace it. So we've got to change. The current path is unsustainable. We've known for many, many years that we have about 10% of the population that n needs to consume about 70% of our healthcare resources, and those are our people. Chronically ill, those with multiple comorbidities, frail people with many different problems. And you'd think by now we would have learned to target our resources wisely on that, but we haven't done that yet not universally across the country. We're losing half of those people in transitions from hospitals to your place. And 20% of those just go right back into the hospital, half of them without having ever seen a primary care physician. And that's got to stop because it's unsustainable. We know that 70% of us now and in the future will use long-term services and supports. and. Yet Medicaid, which is a huge payer of that, is strained, unsustainable in every state. We've got to change our ways and do something different. What do we do in our field? Well, I know what I'm personally doing. Uh, on your behalf, I'm going back to that somewhat dysfunctional Washington, D.C., where, get this, what they have me doing now is going through the federal budget hour after hour. Oh, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I used to be a normal person. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it actually is pretty depressing that Redding, Redding, as far as you uh, can see, and we know that health care costs have to come down and Conventionally, what people do is say, oh, let's cut provider rates, but that's unsustainable now as a future approach. So what are we going to do? Well, in part, the roadmap for where we're going to go is in that little-known second half of the health reform bill. The last thousand pages that maybe you didn't get to when you mired in the first thousand pages the whole second half of the health care reform bill is chock full of every innovative idea, left, right, and center, plausible ideas of how we as a nation can really quickly learn to make uh, changes in how we're doing things. There's money going into it. There's money being taken away from one side, money going into learning, innovating, implementing ideas, uh, PACE programs. Boy, that looks like that works. How do we scale that up to uh, make it more of a national idea? How do we figure out how to pay for what we really want? We know that certain sectors, not for profit, by the way, provide greater bang for our buck. Well, we need to get more of that. So how do we do that? How do we change our payment systems? How do we connect ourselves all up so we're not <laughs> losing people uh, in the transition? We have a roadmap. We have processes uh, to rapidly bring new innovative ideas uh, forward. 
But even the best road map won't get us where we need to go if there's no one willing to take a journey. And if there are no live wires around to jumpstart the engine, so how do we do that? Well, I've learned that here too at this convention. You know, one of the ideas that's in healthcare reform and it's innovative ideas, these accountable care organizations. Sounds like something we might know how to do, being accountable, caring, new organizations, but it's kind of mysterious. And yet we know that they're uh, going to be going, well, I was getting ready to give a talk uh, to talk about how, well, the regulations for those aren't even out yet, and this isn't defined, that isn't defined, so models are good, but we have to learn this. And the fellow from Pennsylvania, one of you, came up to me and he said, are you going to talk about those accountable care organizations? And I said, Lord, I'm going to try. And he said, no problem. He said, I'm not sure what they are either, but I've already been to talk to my hospital and making friends and showing them how I can help them uh, avoid uh, avoidable rehospitalizations. I've already been to talk to my, uh, my doctor group there and we're going to be there. I thought, that's kind of leading edgy, isn't it? Okay, bundling, another idea. Another idea, it kind of sounds scary um, because we know that we're the nimble little fish but we want to make sure that we thrive in this new world also and it kind of sounds like the hospital's going to uh, might eat our lunch under that bundling. Well, I was going to get up and talk about how the bundling demo, it doesn't even start until 2015, then it goes for five years and we'll all be dead by then, so let's not worry about that. <laughs> but a better idea, a better idea of how to, <laughs> of how to do, uh, do with that is what we learned in the uh, trip that many of you took to the Jewish home uh, of LA yesterday. Well, they're basically a low income, uh, served low income housing. And what did they do a while ago when they couldn't make the whole system work? They, did, they didn't get eaten by a hospital, they made one, they created one. They didn't uh, uh, die for lack of finding primary care, they put one uh, physician group together. Very leading AG. So <laughs> what's the future look like for us? It's the same loving, caring, ASA, but now the critically needed leading age. And I'm pumped up to <laughs> inspire, serve, and advocate. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Susan, Marsha, Lauren, hate to tell you, you have to follow Barbara. And quickly. She has to follow I'm always Barbara. following Barbara. She's following Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I follow great, Barbara. Thank you. I'd like to take really about 90 seconds to talk to you about CCRC issues right now. You know, um, CCRCs are, are popular. The residents love them. The public likes them. So it's unusual for us to feel a challenge there. But we've had two this year that I think we should pay attention to, not necessarily because of the results, but because of the messages that they give us. The first is um, the GAO report that came out this summer. Um, the good news here is that there was no bad news. Um, they visited CCRCs, the General Accountability Office, they visited CCRCs, they were worried about solvency because of the economic crisis, they were worried about resident funds. They visited organizations, they talked to people who run them, and they talked to the residents who live there, okay? all positive reports. And here's the lesson we take from that, from the GAO report in my mind. The residents who talked to them were the residents that had been well informed by their executive staff on exactly what the situations were in, in the organization and what steps the organization had taken to protect them. And those residents had a comfort that translated to the GAO as this is a good place to live. So a lesson to us about how well we communicate because it's very important. The second issue I just want to talk to you a minute about is Mission Ridge. Um, those of you who are CCRCs know um, about Mission Ridge. They know that the IRS is looking at entrance fee um, arrangements and investments to see if they may be subject to arbitrage yield requirements. We think the IRS may come down in our favor on this. This is a four-year case. Um, Mission Ridge, Kent Burgess in Montana has been carrying this case for all of us. Um, 
Waiting for the IRS determination is one thing, and we don't know when it'll come, but if it's adverse, we know that we will be going to Congress with this, and in, in a lot of ways, that Congress is perfectly positioned now to look at this case because they have interest in tax issues, um, and this is one they can fix readily. Okay. Thank you. Marcia, briefly. Okay, thank you. Well, as you have heard, we have had, over the past few years, and will continue to have, a huge and transformational agenda that well defines us as leading age. But I want to talk to you a little bit about your role in this as Will Lauren. And so we're the pair here together. Um, when we go up on the hill, and by we, I don't just mean I'm not the only one up there. Um, and, and Larry has become an excellent advocate, as has everybody at, in the advocacy division. But I wanted to mention specifically the real um, core people who have to be up on the hill, in addition to myself. That's Elena and Morgan and Nancy and Peter. And they carry your message up on the hill. But when we carry your message, we are just DC. When we go up on the hill, we bring a list of the members from the states or the districts, not a fistful of checks. And that's a very powerful, powerful way to advocate. In fact, it is frankly the only way that I would want to advocate. But that means that when we go up and we give a member of Congress or their staff a list, and that member or that staff person looks down and says, oh, I've been to this member and I know this one and I know what a CCRC is because my mother is in one and I, you know, I've been to this nursing home and you do a fabulous job and yes, my aunt is in this um, subsidized housing. That is very, very powerful. It means that you have been doing your job means that you have done your job to build the relationships that we need with people on the Hill and people in power. Because once they know you, they've never had a bad experience. Once they know you, they know ASA, soon to be leading age, they know not-for-profits, they know the value and the importance of your mission and our mission to serve and represent you. I cannot overemphasize the importance of your relationships and your ability to build those relationships, and to come to Washington, but also to bring those folks to you. When they see you, they have a whole different image of us. And we walk in as your servants and not just as, you know, the capital L on our forehead for lobbyists. And that is very, very important. It made it possible for us to do the things with health reform that we were able to do and with housing that we are have been able to do, and it will make it possible for us to do even more as we go forward. So how does that happen, and how can ASA help you do that? I'm going to turn that over to Lauren. Thank you. Um, if I could drive home two points very quickly, it's one that good grassroots is something you are very good at because it's about relationships. And in your role as not-for-profits and as employers, you have a very broad reach through your board members, your residents, and their families. So I say that to you to help make you comfortable with it. The other thing that I will offer you the comfort of is that we are here to be your partner, and you pay us to be your partner. So if anybody in this room is interested in doing the four steps that Wynne Marshall outlined on Monday, and I hope that all of you are, we want to work with you. You can look at our grassroots hub online, which is asa.org slash grassroots, or send us an email at congress at asa.org, and we will be in touch with all of you with, to give you the tools and the support that you need to get this job done. So thank you. We are really looking forward to working with you. Thank you. Susan? Susan, this is your parting shot of wisdom. There are two adages we follow when, when we do advocacy work, and the first one is, where there's a will, there's a way. There is no question about our will. What we are on, on the, the hunt for right now is the way that we're going to get things done this year with different people in different offices. There's no such thing as a bad member of Congress. There's no such thing as a good Congress or a bad Congress. It is simply a Congress and a vehicle for us to move. 
I want you to know that even if it looks like the chips are down for us, okay, ASA has been very sharp about looking for opportunities. Sometimes you can slide something into something else, sometimes you can pull something out of something else. Um, we've become very adroit at looking for opportunities. One of our favorites the last few years has been the defense bill. You can almost do anything on a defense bill, okay? <laughs> um, because nobody's looking anymore. The second adage is that we recognize that no single political party is good for all the members on all the issues all the time. ASA maintains its friendships on both sides of the aisle at all times. And our challenge this year is to take the agenda we've been given, the agenda of the Hill, and figure out how we work that agenda for what you need. And it will always be that way. ASA never writes off. A, a session of Congress because we think somebody doesn't like the party that's in control, okay? Never, ever write it off, and neither should you. Um, these folks have told you how well prepared they are to do what you need. They need your support. And on that, um, I'll say thank you on behalf of the whole team for the support you've given us in the last year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One of them. Um, Perhaps Susan's most important legacy is that she is uh, leaving us with a great team of people and uh, more goodwill uh, out there between you and our advocacy agenda than we can uh, measure. And I want to tell you, your board spends most of its time in its meetings on making sure we come up with the right policy for the right reasons. And don't you forget, we're from Washington and we're here to help you. Thank you, Susan, God bless.